so we ask you to talk about Fredericia, which is uh, growing rather than moving, right? Yes. And, uh, but you're also now a new partner at KCP. <laughs> And uh, so what's that about? So you're changing as a, as a firm, just in short? Yeah, we are, uh, we are growing, uh, expanding both in the Rotterdam uh, office as in the Zurich office, uh, because we have been very active abroad during the crisis, and now the Dutch projects are uh, on the rise again. So there's a lot of work. Uh, we're also broadening our profile, not only architecture and urban planning, but now also landscape architecture. And that's being successful. Yeah. And we're actually looking for staff so more people, please. So I saw on the list many people from TU Delft, right? So perhaps you can pitch a bit, right? Ah, yeah. Yeah, well, we are, uh, as I said, uh, an office who tries to work uh, multidisciplinary. We operate international uh, on projects, uh, especially in Europe, uh, but also We're Asia actually going and to Russia. Pitch you. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you give okay. me the opening, I take it. <laughs> Um, I'm really doing a, a project presentation. Uh, it's, it's a project uh, which I uh, really enjoyed working on. Uh, it's in Denmark um, and it's in the town uh, of Fredericia, uh, a really quiet uh, provincial uh, city. Uh, so this project actually uh, enabled them to expand their city center with 25%. So it was a huge uh, uh, opportunity, but also a challenge for the city to uh, go through this uh, process of uh, making a plan. And we actually uh, came into this process through uh, a competition, but already a lot of steps were done uh, previously to uh, set this project uh, on the rails. So I'll take you along a bit uh, with, that, uh, with, with that process design. This is the site, uh, beautifully located at the Little Belt, uh, Danish Sea Strait. Um, and the location is uh, quite centrally located in, uh, in Jutland, uh, where Fredericia is one of uh, three uh, provincial towns which are very close to each other, but also competing uh, a bit. And actually this whole region is competing with the very popular region of Copenhagen, where a lot of talent uh, is, is going through and a lot of economy. So they, they're struggling uh, as a region to keep jobs, to keep people, keep talent, and uh, to make a next step in development. And it's not making it easier that they're competing uh, among each other. So this city is really uh, running behind a bit in this competition with uh, other local cities. So they really wanted to have this project to reposition them uh, in this uh, situation. The city had some great assets. It's a historical city which was a garrison, a uh, military fortification to defend this uh, sea strait. Uh, and it was uh, built by the king uh, uh, first as a um, yeah, with barracks and uh, military activities, uh, but they also invited uh, yeah, new people to uh, come and live in the city and be farmers. But uh, in the beginning, it was not very popular, so they actually uh, created some quite innovative laws uh, which allowed, for example, freedom of religion. It's a very uh, radical concept at that time. So a lot of Huguenots, Jews uh, moved to the city. So from the start, it was a very uh, diverse city. And uh, uh, still up to today, it, uh, it has this consistency. Um, it also had these uh, beautiful ramparts, these quite intact uh, military garrison uh, parts where the city was very proud uh, on, and this uh, grid structure, which was also very uh, recognizable for, uh, for this city. So here you see these assets. Um, and this grid structure also really runs in straight lines uh, towards this uh, beautiful uh, waterfront. But the waterfront uh, where the project is located was actually very industrial. It was a fertilizer company with big chimneys, uh, a lot of pollution, and uh, alongside it, uh, a shipyard. Um, but uh, closing down these uh, activities uh, was not popular at all within the village. Uh, a lot of uh, people had jobs there. So when uh, this visionary mayor initiated this project and uh, had these uh, functions removed, 
he uh, lost the election. So at that point, the project was not uh, supported at all by uh, the local community. Although that uh, situation was uh, really bad and the whole city uh, had a stigma uh, in the region as being very industrious, smelly, unattractive, so uh, it was also not appealing uh, to attract new uh, citizens. But this site was uh, acquired by a new development company, which was uh, called Fredericia C, uh, which was a collaboration between the municipality and Real Dania. And Real Dania was a very uh, special organization within Denmark. They are um, a philanthropic, philanthropic institution who uh, uh, manages uh, a huge capital which was left over after dismantling uh, Danish homeowners uh, association. And this money they are using uh, to promote sustainable urban development. Uh, they through that, do that through uh, sponsoring research, but also uh, initiating uh, projects uh, like this. So they brought not only uh, money to the table, which was of course very convenient, uh, but also a lot of knowledge and ambition. For example, University of uh, Copenhagen, who made a, a very ambitious set of sustainability rules. Uh, but because the project condition was uh, quite bad, there was a lot of resistance from uh, local inhabitants against uh, this transformation. Uh, a first step in this whole process was to clear the site and not start with development right away, but uh, first implement a temporary landscape. Uh, yeah, this is the program which we later had to implement. Um, but this temporary landscape uh, was uh, very much uh, making the, the site public, accessible, and really making it part of uh, the, the city and making citizens able to uh, go there, uh, not only uh, visit, it, visit it, but also participate in uh, shaping uh, this landscape. Though. So as a uh, landscape architect, they went through an uh, extensive process of uh, co-designing uh, this landscape with uh, local people. Um, which proved very successful, not only creating a, an attractive landscape, but also um, a support from uh, the, the citizens that this project could actually become theirs and that they really had a voice in uh, making the future of, uh, of their city. And everybody understood that this was uh, temporary, but it became uh, very successful. And it also became a tool for uh, community building. There was a very successful uh, Grow Your City uh, initiative where urban farming really became a hotspot uh, where people meet and uh, could talk about the future of uh, this, uh, this area development. There were also a lot of um, uh, participation moments. Uh, and as White Architecture already uh, mentioned, you have to be quite active. Because if you see the composition of these people who show up uh, to a regular invitation, they're yeah, quite senior, quite white, quite uh, yeah, not really representative of the uh, full uh, community. So there were also uh, efforts made to involve uh, the unusual suspects like the kids who build like their whole new city in Legos and also actually build a piece which was uh, reconstructed in the, in the landscape design. So yeah, a lot of efforts of uh, creating this dialogue and that actually led to a very substantial brief uh, which was compiled, which uh, included all these uh, visions and uh, wishes from the community and which gave uh, a very uh, important input to uh, a design competition. And that's at that point uh, where we got involved. We were one of the firms who uh, was invited to uh, uh, take part in this competition. It was a very special competition. It was an open dialogue competition, which meant that um, even while we were still working on the design, we presented it uh, not only to the client, but also to uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, citizens, but also our competing uh, design firms. So uh, it was actually sort of open. Everybody could steal ideas from uh, everybody. But uh, somehow it, uh, it went well. And it went through several rounds where uh, our uh, firm uh, came out as, uh, as a winning uh, team. 
and it was also a very constructive process because that uh, avoided that um, the architects would be in their bubble and then present something which would not be aligned with the expectations of both clients, stakeholders and uh, citizens. Uh, so that was a very uh, supportive uh, process uh, where uh, yeah, models, panels were shown to, uh, to the public and, uh, and discussed throughout uh, this process. Um, but it's important to stress that it was not only a sort of public vote. There was, there was no public vote. Uh, there was a sort of listening to citizens, but it was also um, it was decided by uh, experts. Uh, because yeah, the assignment was very complex, and that way uh, they did balance uh, yeah the the wishes of citizens with uh, also a lot of uh, technical, financial, feasibility issues, which a project uh, has to include. And our project was winning because it included already uh, some. Um, uh, obvious things from the brief, like uh, the, the, the citizens wanted the grid to be continued. They wanted these long views to the water, so that was a fixed element that all designers included. They were very proud of their ramparts, uh, so we actually closed uh, a green loop, uh, which uh, made a more consistent green network by, uh, in another way, reconstructing uh, a fortification part which was lost uh, in history, uh, but which uh, with our proposal stood out with uh, the canals, uh, which not, none of the other uh, competitors uh, put into their proposal, because at the starting event, the client stressed that uh, however that uh, citizens have been uh, asking for these canals or suggesting that there should be more water in the area, uh, the client uh, did not want us to uh, propose that because it would be too costly uh, to, uh, to implement. Um, but we also saw that there was uh, this history uh, with extended canals in the city uh, and we took that uh, wish from the citizens uh, very serious. So we started thinking like, yeah, how can we actually make this feasible? And uh, maybe you saw the composition of our team. There was also uh, the economical planners of Facton who supported us very strongly in making a good business case because these canals would not only offer uh, uh, a great uh, new typology of public space uh, in that area. It would also be a sort of branding tool to reposition this, uh, this city in this, uh, in this region. Um, and the canals, they were positioned in a way uh, which extended uh, this waterfront uh, yeah, with, with several uh, kilometers, actually creating a high uh, quality public space. Uh, but the canals were also used to uh, create a resilient city because currently the city had uh, flooding issues um, and the earth which we were able to dig out of the canals was used to raise the whole site by one meter, which was then the safe uh, level for, uh, and the climate proof level uh, for uh, the, the, the sea level uh, raises which were uh, to be expected. Uh, also, um, this uh, project was published in this uh, uh, climate-proofed uh, uh, area development where the landscape architects of SLA also made a nice uh, uh, embankment which uh, protects the city from uh, flooding. So the whole project now has a creates a strong barrier to protect the city against flooding. But raising this whole uh, area by one meter also actually helped to cap off uh, heavily polluted sites and the canals were so positioned that they would not cut through uh, expensive uh, sanitation sites which were the yellow ones and the, the blue ones uh, but it could cut through uh, the, the orange ones um, so it also helped uh, solving that and which really convinced our client was that we were able to demonstrate that um, the revenues, the value created by making this canal uh, in real estate uh, would uh, be a lot more than the cost of uh, this canal. So they would earn themselves back and solve uh, a lot of problems in one uh, go. So yeah, that's uh, something that this client had to calculate uh, three times and they were 
<laughs> they were really uh, stressing like, okay, we do believe you now finally. Uh, and all our Danish competitors, they were very pissed because they said like, you Dutch guys, you cheated because the client said it was not allowed and you did do canals and now you won. So, but yeah, <laughs> bad luck for them. Uh, good thing was also that it got a huge support by uh, the community. Uh, so also this turning this project condition from a very negative uh, uh, position, uh, sort of very negative uh, um, yeah, appreciation by uh, the citizens to uh, a very positive one was, uh, was a huge win for this client. People started raising their hands like, where can I sign in to, uh, to buy a house and, and can it be built quick enough because I'm getting already old. So please uh, get, uh, get this thing uh, forward, which was totally different from the earlier meetings. What we also did on uh, the more uh, social uh, sustainability aspect was to um, not only creating a landscape which could connect these ramparts and making uh, new connections for sports and accessibility to a uh, sport field, uh, but also relocating some of these um, activities which were tested in this temporary landscape so that there would be a continuity between the temporary landscape and the final landscape where aspects like urban farming could, uh, could take place. We also designed it in a way that uh, cars, uh, car access was very limited and uh, pedestrians and uh, bikes uh, were dominant in, uh, in the public space. And uh, typologies uh, which were designed by uh, our partner firm uh, Van Kunsten, uh, they were very much organized around uh, uh, community building, uh, collective uh, housing where courtyards would uh, be as uh, little privatized as possible, but mainly given to uh, the people who are living around it uh, so that people can meet, that there can be uh, a greenhouse where you could, uh, could do urban farming or you could have a shared tool shed. Uh, so sharing economy and the like was also implemented. Also micro squares, uh, not only big public spaces, but also the smaller uh, meeting uh, and community spaces were introduced. Um, also having some teams like uh, recycling, there was also a whole uh, waste management uh, strategy which was uh, implemented. But also some bigger uh, cultural and economic uh, concepts. Uh, for example, the city was famous for a musical academy uh, and they wanted to have a new theater because this academy was, was really nationally famous. It uh, delivered all the musical singers uh, of Denmark, which I don't know how many they are, but at least it was small and very specialized. Um, and uh, this, um, recently it was confirmed that it, this theater uh, will be built and it will become a new major attractor. And they also planned sort of new micro academies uh, because uh, the competing town already had uh, all these educational uh, functions. So they wanted to specialize in smaller but highly uh, specialized educational institutions. Also um, an institute who was related to the military history who uh, would take care of veterans would be uh, positioned in this uh, development plan. So here's the, um, the musical uh, opera, um, theater. Uh, and another important aspect in uh, the city regeneration was that uh, um, this, the retail center, which is colored uh, uh, blue here, was suffering uh, from a uh, relation with these competing cities. And uh, our part uh, wanted to add more retail, but it was essential to create a good link with the existing and the new uh, retail so uh, that uh, it would operate as one system. And to do that, uh, um, a container village was uh, initiated as a temporary use where uh, different shop owners, local initiative, uh, very bottom up uh, actors could have a container and uh, do uh, something in that, uh, which draws in people and which starts making this link with uh, the historical uh, center, shopping center. Maybe on the more technical side, I already explained, we entered this competition with uh, three uh, uh, parties. Uh, we were one of the smallest teams in this whole uh, competition. Um, 
So the client thought we, he could add some more advisors to our team, um, which was then uh, the team for the development plan. So they added the landscape architect, uh, the Danish architect, uh, two more, no, three more uh, uh, engineering firms. Uh, and we were, as a design firm, in charge of managing this uh, whole uh, army of uh, advisors. Because uh, there's not only the community side, there's also a very uh, high sustainability level. So this whole plan was tested on microclimate. This is the wind modeling, for example, on uh, sun exposure, uh, also including energy strategy uh, with solar panels, which turns out this whole development in a CO2 neutral uh, development, uh, but also dealing with uh, explosion hazards, both from uh, um, a shell uh, uh, gas uh, jetty as uh, a freezing uh, company uh, and uh, also dealing with noise pollution from uh, these neighboring harbor activities. So a lot of technicalities uh, which you can't see in uh, the beautiful pictures which uh, uh, we put on our website. Uh, but it's uh, really this balancing of these two sides, both stakeholder management as a sort of very thorough um, uh, sustainability approach, which uh, are both combined into this project. And uh, we are very happy that it's now uh, being built. Uh, this is uh, quite recent. Um, and to our surprise also, uh, this canal has been really taken into use by uh, the community. And we never expected that they would actually now yearly organize a triathlon where people uh, will swim uh, through this canal. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, same question, anybody? Uh, otherwise, I have some. <laughs> okay, so Jeroen, I, I'm puzzled because, uh, as you know, as a Rotterdam, Rotterdammer, I might say, it's a dirty word, but okay. Um, we have been building this movement the past few years that's built on the notion that everybody can contribute to the future of Rotterdam. If you're a designer mastering complex urban transformations like yourself, or as a single mom with two kids <coughs> wants to do something. So and this is the notion that we believe in. And uh, we should invite people to contribute. And um, I'm puzzled, because now we're seeing this new municipality, new government saying, we have to build, build, build. We have to step up, build more houses, large scale urban developments. So how, how can people be a part of those complex processes? Uh, and try to get some pointers from your presentation, because in that sense, I think it's very inspiring. So perhaps, what might you want to take from this process back to your own local situation? What is it that you might say Rotterdam might learn from, especially? I think, I think anyway, this combined approach is something we, we advocate because uh, we've noticed that a lot of people within the design community during the crisis have been uh, very negative about uh, master planning and urban design as being very top down. I think the notion of our profession is not only top down, but it did put a lot of municipalities among uh, Rotterdam or The Hague in a position where they were uh, stopping making plans uh, and now they are in this uh, economic situation where there's a lack of housing, uh, there's an urgency and then suddenly it can't go fast enough while we had years to make those plans which uh, but, but I think as a design com community we uh, se have sent out the wrong message. We should have been a lot more proactive looking ahead that after a crisis there will be again uh, uh, a growth of the city and uh, we should have taken that time to make those plans with uh, people from the, from the community, with the municipality and market parties. Yeah. So there's some applause actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's both a plea for making plans as well as making them with local communities. I do say that like 
uh, like we often make a lot of illustrative plans, like these renders they, they show as, as, as if it's built. Uh, that's never our intention. It's, it's always uh, that we design frameworks and then, uh, of course, over time these plans will always be reappropriated by uh, other designers, other architects, uh, uh, community involvement, uh, the park as we rendered it will be totally differently designed when uh, people will be involved. So uh, the idea that planning uh, or, or urban design is trying to dictate everything is certainly not something we stand for. Uh, so I think in that case you also have to frame it that um, we set the first idea and that idea is sort of a first step which can only be um, improved upon. What, what I found was inspiring that the people actually were involved at the earliest stages possible, yeah. really drafting the brief of, for you guys to pick up and move from. Yeah. So is that something we're seeing in the Netherlands, that people are way up front and thinking about what actually would be in the brief to do? Uh, I don't know that many processes here that start like that. No, there are some processes we have been involved in where people were uh, at the beginning uh, involved in uh, the design uh, process, but not in sort of setting the brief uh, process. I, I guess there, were, will, there have been some processes who have done that, but I, I'm not aware of any. Okay. So, uh, any uh, questions arisen uh, already? No? Would you recommend the process? Um, I, I think that's I'm, the other... I'm uh, repeating because we have a camera, that's, uh, that's why I do that. That's the other thing which is uh, highly underestimated, that this kind of process takes a lot of uh, energy, a lot of uh, investment, a lot of time. Uh, and uh, there has to be a willingness from uh, parties involved to invest in, in, in good city making and that yeah, the, the hours spent on dialogue, on uh, getting people together, that's, that's not recognized enough. Here we are often invited for short pitches and then just throw an idea and then uh, we'll get it for, uh, further from there. No, we have to be a lot more aware of these processes that they take time, that they take energy and uh, an investment. Yeah. Okay, so perhaps back to you. Uh from some Sweden perspective, you do a lot of uh, large-scale urban area developments, not only the ones you showed here. Uh, so uh, what would, would you say on your short visits uh, you would like to take from Rotterdam and then perhaps the other way around? We've seen, uh, I mean, it's only been here for two days, so, <laughs> but it's, uh, but the thing that's, it's very striking is uh, how how different how close our countries are and how different things work, uh, and how the, the the urban planning is so much dependent on the political system and it backs it up, and it's 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 very interesting to see how you are tackling things here, and I see that we can learn a lot from you, and yesterday we were very impressed that you have gathered this community of engaged uh, uh, stakeholders that meets, I think you said four times a year, we attended a dinner, and what you all had in common was Rotterdam's future, and it being developed in the right way, and I, and I, I would love to see something like that for Stockholm, maybe, maybe there is something like that, but I, don't, I, I think it's too big, I think you have to do it in municipalities, but it's, it's this thing of uh, stakeholder collaboration, that we hear all the time about how important it is that stakeholders, different stakeholders collaborate and also together with the community, but it's very seldom it's actually happening. So I'm, I was glad to see that happening yesterday. And so uh, perhaps to add to that, because we were talking about that just in, before we started, how important is diversity in that sense from your perspective? How important is it to really work on that. Mm. Also, I think that on this note of diversity, I mean, you see it as well, that's what, why you're working with these kind of methods that you're working with, and I guess a lot of us that are here um, have this kind of same idea as well, that uh, urban planning and architecture really have to man up to represent the diversity of the actual communities, of the actual cities, of the actual world in order to develop them 
in, in a good way, in a, in a sensible understanding way, um, we have to be informed by the city, n not the other way around. And I think diversity really is, is the key word. And I think it's uh, striking from the discussions we had yesterday and today also that uh, people are very um, good with talking about uh, the public space where all the meetings are supposed to happen. Because I think sometimes when we try to have dialogue, people are focusing very much on their own um, land or their own thing, but trying to talk together about the public space that we actually have to share and, and have a discussion about that I think is very uh, interesting to hear, and also the way you talk about it and the, in the discussion, I think it's a very good thing. Okay. So, uh, I think before, yeah, there's something coming there. Um, so, I think both of these presentations really emphasize the importance of the process rather than like the strategy, strategy or what exactly you do. And for me, it seemed like, especially in this engaging all these diverse actors. What were the enabling factors for you for this process of learning and having all these different viewpoints coming together, all these different um, actors involved in the project, all the different views from the community to really be integrated and yeah, come up with a good end result? What were the enabling factors for that? Yeah, I think um, we are not specialized in doing uh, com community engagement as such. Uh, often we collaborate with uh, external partner, uh, parties. We, we don't have an anthropologist uh, in our firm, for example, but uh, uh, often these firms, they uh, already do a lot of uh, interviews. Uh, what our specialty is a bit is to uh, use design as a research tool to um, and sort of envision and uh, illustrate the complexity of these assignments and, and the choices which you have to make uh, throughout this uh, process by translating all these ambitions and wishes uh, into a spatial plan because then you can see that there's also competing uh, ambitions. There's also some uh, conflicts uh, which sometimes you can resolve and sometimes not. And, and Using design and very also very illustrative uh, way of design uh, has helped us a lot to um, make steps in the process and to guide uh, choices in these uh, complex uh, stakeholder uh, fields. Okay. Yeah. Well, in both of these cases, the developers since the beginning they were open for the participation, but. How would you act if the developer wants more traditional way of the process? And how would you con try to convince him to involve people to the uh, design process? Same question perhaps for uh, Victoria. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very contextual. I think in, um, in, in Scandinavian uh, context, uh, it has become standard to, to do uh, uh, sort of involvement, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but at least even more than here. It's, it's very uh, democratic, very horizontal. Uh, the Netherlands, also a lot of municipalities push for it, so public uh, actors are asking it, but not always, and it very much depends also on how much um, the projects uh, has an impact on an existing community. I've been involved for over 12 years now in a transformation of a social uh, housing neighborhood in Amersfoort. And from the beginning, uh, a representative group of uh, uh, citizens were involved in uh, deciding over this plan. Um, I'm now also working in areas where nobody is living and we're always talking about, yeah, what will the future owners want? But yeah, that's very speculative. So in some contexts you have to do it and in other contexts it's not really uh, helping. So perhaps for you as well, uh, who is enabling you to do what you do?